I'm in Mudgee, New South Wales, to visit the olive grove of grower Peter Ampt, and I'm here to find out how he's using native grasses on his olive grove floor to improve tree nutrition, reduce his pest and disease burden, and get a better crop. <laughs> Pete! Tim. How are you going, mate? Very good, thanks, Tim. Thank you so much for the opportunity to come out here today. I'm really interested in your olive grove floor and the impacts that that's having on soil health, pest insects, and a range of other benefits for your tree operation. So first off, mate, tell me about this beautiful olive grove. Yeah, well, we've got um, five hectares under olives, 1,200 yeah. olive trees. It's a small operation. Um, we produce Tuscan-style olive oil from Frantoia and Crediola varieties. Uh, we get maybe between 10 tonnes or so, around 10 tonnes a year. Fairly inconsistent from year to year, but still that's what the district is like. And that's weather dependent, isn't it? I think it is, yes, I think it is. I think it's just, it's, it's not the ideal climate for olives, but it still produces very good olive oil. And you value add your olives, you don't send them off to be processed somewhere, you do your own We production. We do, we get them pressed locally and then we do all our bottling and marketing. So we sell um, through farmers markets, through our website. We also sell to um, restaurants. So, um, and that covers most of our production. Now, Peter, you've got a background actually in native grass research at a major university. What's led you to adopting a native grass sward under your olive trees? And what sort of grasses do we have here? Okay, well, um, what what I've recognised from the research that I've done and lots of others have done is that um, native perennial grasses are can be the absolute backbone of our grazing industries. Um, if you get a, a good, diverse perennial grass sward, then that can pr provide a foundation for a whole lot of really good things to happen. So it, it um, crowds out weeds, it, it, um, it starts to generate its own nutrient cyclings, nutrient cycling, um, and it provides um, a range of foods for grazing animals. Yes. And so we've learned that that's a really good system and very good adaptive planned grazing can encourage a, um, a, a dense perennial sward of grasses, per, um, native grasses, it can be naturalised grasses as well. Um, and that, that has a hu huge benefits. Now what sort of grasses do we have here under your trees? Th this one, we've got quite a lot of um, barbed wire grass yes. here which is a, a quite a good perennial grass. It's, it's actually, pretty. yeah, it's, it's a lot of people use it for as an ornamental. Um, but uh, what I do basically to encourage the grasses is just make sure that I never slash uh, until the grasses have seeded. You can see these ones are already mature. And so, you know, if you strip them and, and rub them, you can see the, the seeds there. Um, and so if I slash now, those seeds are all viable and they will land and a certain proportion of them will germinate and it keeps the native grass seed bank going. And so anytime there's good germination conditions, some of them will come up. And that means that you just get this range of grasses and they, they self-regenerate and they, um, they protect the soil. I can see the soil here is nice and open. There's fungus on the top of the soil. Uh, it's nice and open, the water will penetrate nicely. And this is on a, on a rocky hillside with very little topsoil. And so this is built up over the years that I've been here. So Pete, how do you manage native grass swords under a crop so that it doesn't get choked out or overrun with weeds? A uh, number of things. Um, we're not on a very fertile slope here. Yep. So the amount of growth is not unmanageable generally, yep. depending on the year, obviously. Um, I will slash the, uh, the floor of the orchard, of the grove, um, but I always wait until the native grasses have seeded before I do that. Now, how do you know with native grasses, there, you've got so many different ones, yes. how do you know when it's the right time to actually have that slashing intervention and the seeds are mature enough? Okay, well, well this one, um, most of the grasses fit into either winter winter flowering or summer flowering okay. and these ones it's the, it's the end of summer now early autumn yes. and so these have all dried out these ones you can see um, you know there's lots of 
viable seed there. It breaks out of the seed head very easily. So you'll um, literally walk along and you'll you'll rub and yeah. see if the seeds are breaking out of the seed head and yeah. they look brown. That's right, basically, yes. And basically. that's as scientific as it gets. That's pretty much so. Yeah, pretty much so. I mean, you watch the grasses every day pretty much. Yeah. And once they're browned off and you see the seed heads maturing, you know that it's time to go. Um, Ob observation is something that I think when we're talking off camera is, going to, is something that's going to come out in this story a lot, isn't it? Well, yeah, I guess I'm watching it all the time. I'm on the, on the ground in the grove most days. Um, you see the changes come and go. Um, I also do some systematic monitoring as well yep. just to make sure that things are going the way I want them to go. So don't slash the grass or cut underneath the trees when it suits you do it when it suits the grass and the trees. Basically, yes. And, and essentially, the native grasses look after the weeds. Um, if you've got a good dense sward, you'll get very little weeds because most weeds are volunteer plants yes. that colonize bare ground. And if you've got good native grasses, then it just doesn't really happen. Um, so I, I'm, I have never controlled weeds in this grove. Now I notice you've also got quite a bit of mulch under the trees here. You actually use the prunings from each tree put them through a mulcher and put them onto the base I of the do. tree every winter? I do, I do. And that, that works well. I mean, it basically protects the soil as well under the trees. Yes. It stops the grasses being too dense under the trees generally because you've got all of that mat of, of prunings. Right, right. But also, so by putting, by putting the prunings back underneath in a mulched condition, you're actually managing the density of the grass. Uh, to, a, to an extent, yes. And it's also good for water because you can see we've got an irrigation sprinkler there. Yep. Um, and so if the w water's falling on the mulch it drips through and yep. you get a humid layer yes. and so you get more effective use of water with the mulch. Now I suppose you're also probably going to have a very high carbon to nitrogen ratio which is going to suit beneficial fungi as well aren't you? Well there's certainly um, fungal attack in the litter here which is what I look for. You, you want uh, the fungal material there. Yeah. So you'll actually go through and you'll have a look for the evidence of fungal attack which is spores in the leaf litter and yes. that's a good sign. You it's a good sign, yeah definitely. Now I suppose because you're using native grasses you're also encouraging the colonisation of fungi that's optimised for this particular soil too, aren't you? Exactly right, exactly right. Those um, mycorrhizal fungi that are specific to these grasses would be here. Um, and that's helping the general nutrition. They're probably combining with the olive trees and getting a cooperation between the grasses and the olive trees to help nutrition. Because plants communicate, don't they? And they share nutrition. They do, they do. And also, in, in a relatively poor soil, rocky hillside like this, yes. um, you only need a small amount of, of labile nutrients yes. and the fungi and the, the association between the fungi and the plants helps to generate that small amount of labile nutrients and that helps to provide the nutrition to the tree. So if we start to interfere with herbicide and get rid of these grasses, we then remove the fungi, and so we remove the labile nutrition and we have to start on a chemical fertiliser route. Well, that's right. I mean, I've, I've, I do leaf testing of these trees to determine whether they're deficient in any, anything, and so far they're fine. Uh, there's no significant problems, and so I know that just maintaining the grass here is enough to provide the nutrition that the trees need. Now, Peter, you do have some insect pests in the grove. Yes, uh, the main pest of olives in the southeastern Australia is the olive lace bug. And this is some of the evidence this is, of damage. It's called here. lace bug because it makes a lacy look on the leaf like that. Yep. Um, and they s suck the sap from the leaves and they lay their eggs in the leaves. Right. So, um, so this is something you have to control with a spray? It is. We were organic, but we couldn't control lace bug with organic methods. We so tried cultural methods, we tried um, organic pyrethrums, yes. but they weren't effective um, enough to control the lace bug. And if it gets really bad, uh, a tree will completely lose its leaves and even die off at the base. And if, obviously if it, you're running a business, that's, that's not right. an appropriate response. No. and. It was when we had a really big crop and we had a massive lace bug problem that I thought this is not working, we've got to intervene. And we use a synthetic pyrethroid, which just hangs around a little bit longer than the, 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 the um, organic one. Yep. And it if, is effective, but we've got to do it once and then two weeks later uh, to get the, the, um, the eggs that hatch from the leaves. So 
Now you're finding that this is interfering with some of the beneficial insects, but you're saying that the grass sward is actually serving as a recharge for those insects when you intervene. I think so. I mean, there's a, a huge range of insects that live in the grass sward, mm -hmm. and that's what you want. You want a big variety. You don't want yep. just the pest insect. Yep. You yep. want lots of insects. And you then, want a community. That's right. And we have lots of birds that uh, colonise the grove and the grasses. Yes. And so that's what we want. Um, when we spray, we will kill beneficials that are in the trees, yes. but we don't kill the beneficials that are in the grass. And so they can, they're still here. So we're just spraying directly on the trees and it's a contact spray. And so it would have some effect on the beneficials in the grass, but they still seem to come back. So using appropriate chemicals at the right time of day, yes. so that you're not interfering with insects as they're flying. Yes and ensuring that you only spray when absolutely required and yes. that you follow up so that you don't continue to have a pest disease problem. By maintaining the grass sward under the trees, you're seeing an explosion in beneficial insects and a vibrant community. That's what we're seeing, yes. Now you're also using cultural means to control this bug. Yes. Um, that includes pruning. How do you prune the trees to control the bug? Well, basically we do the classic um, wine glass shape. Yes. So we want the or branches. Vase pruning. Vase is pruning. Yeah. We want the branches around the outside. We want a relatively hollow middle. Yes. That's easier to harvest. It also is allows the spray to penetrate better. Yes. And you're also getting rid of um, unviable branches, which are more likely to get attacked by insects. And you're removing that, I suppose, that warm, damp environment where you've got That's a habitat right. for those insects That's to breed right. up out of control. That's right. The only other ingredient is. I do do systematic monitoring of the insect population. And you do that via pheromone traps or do you do No, that via... I do that just with a, the, the simple, I've got a, a sheet on yeah. a frame and I've got a banger. Yes. And you bang a branch three times and you look at the insects that fall out. And you have a threshold then? Uh, yeah, and I do that, you know, through the, through the whole grove. Um, and, if, and I can see pretty easily then whether the numbers are picking up, whether it's getting to the point where I think it's right time to spray or whether I can not spray. Or maybe I might spray only the sections that are affected um, rather than spraying the whole grove. Yes. So that, that allows me to have the information I need to know how to control the pest. So how many trees would you monitor per block using uh, that method? I would probably walk through, it would take me an hour. I would bang about 50 trees, I would say. Over the four blocks. Over the four blocks. So about yeah. ten a block or so. Yeah, something 10 like that. Probably more than that actually, yeah, thinking right. about it. And are you seeing a lot of beneficial insects in that sample you do. as well? So it's you a good do. way to keep an eye on what yeah. you've actually got. Lots in of your spiders, lots of spiders, lots of ants, lots of um, lace, uh, ladybugs, um, so yeah, a range of things. So I know that they come back yeah. after the spray, which is really encouraging. Now, this underfloor treatment is also building fertility in your grove. Let's go and have a look at some native soil that's just under the bush up above us. Yes. And then let's have a look at the fertility that you're building in this soil in the grove. Okay, great. Now, Peter, the difference between your grove down here and the native woodland just up here is quite stark, isn't it? It is. Yeah, we're, we're sort of on the lower slopes of, the, of this hill. Yes. Um, the upper slopes of the hill are just basically skeletal soils, hardly any soil at all, just rocky. And there's colitis pines growing there, which indicates relative, very low fertility. Um, but as we move down into the grove, this, this, this row here used to be completely bare and now it's pretty well colonized by grasses. And as you head further down, we've got a lot more grasses and a lot more soil formation. So I think we've had soil formation here in the 10 years or so that I've been watching it. Now people say it takes a thousand years to grow soil. You can yeah. grow soil if you use plants. Exactly right. Because you're not growing soil from below, yeah. you're growing soil from above. Yeah. And organic matter and humic matter is soil. It is, that's right. Let's go and have a look at the organic and humic matter that you've got developing in the orchard. Sure. Now Peter, we're four rows down from the native bushland here. And the difference in this soil. It's quite stark, isn't it? I mean, the rocks are still here. I've still got a few rocks. Yeah. But um, what I'm getting is this beautiful chocolate brown soil with lots of pieces of organic matter in it. And I can see plant roots in there that are growing down into the soil and possibly even 
Well, they are. Have a look at the plant roots that are all attaching themselves to this rock and probably getting nutrients out of them via fungi. Very encouraging. And you're also, you've got a lot of moisture in this soil. Like, look at that. I can squeeze it together. And it's at the end of summer. It's a dry period. And I'm getting a lot of moisture in this soil. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy the way... It, it's been really encouraging the way the soil's um, developed here. Um, you know, a couple of rows further up were bare as when we started. Um, it's, the grasses are spreading up the hill, um, taking over the parts that were bare, and, and that's because of this soil development. So it's all really encouraging for us. So by using the right grasses in the right place, and managing the plants and the grasses together rather yep. than managing the business enterprise first. Yes. You're building fertility in your soil. You're getting more resilience in terms of water levels and nutrition for your plants. Yes. You're saving on input costs. Yes. And apart from monitoring, you're reducing your workload, aren't you? Well, yes, absolutely. I mean, there's no, no fertilizing, no herbicide treatment, um, occasional slashing. Um, monitoring is what, what I do mostly, yes, that's right. Now there are some grasses that are problematic. Um, there's some introduced grasses that compete with your crops quite heavily. Yeah. Um, so people can't just be willy-nilly about their grasses. They've got to be careful and they've got to monitor and they've got to watch, don't yes, they? they do. I mean, there are some kikuya and perspalum. If you're in an area where there's a lot of those, they can grow and climb up trees and do all those sorts of things, yes. which you'd have to watch out for. The beauty of the native grasses is they don't do that. They are, they're, they're on the ground uh, and they do the work that they do, building a foundation from everything, for everything else to grow from. If you'd like more information about Pete's research on native grasses and their implications with grazing systems, there's a link in the description. And don't forget, send this video to someone who needs to grow more grass. Hit the subscribe button and we'll see you next week.